Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the latest edition of the ASPS Plastic Surgery Hot Seat Podcast. I am Dr. Stephanie Farber, the ASPS University Dean of Aesthetic Surgery. I am happy to introduce today's episode entitled Scalpel versus Syringe, in which we will have a lively discussion regarding the roles of surgical and non-invasive treatments for various aesthetic concerns. A particularly interesting topic as surgical techniques and non-invasive technology continue to evolve. We are fortunate to have Dr. Sachin Sridharani and Dr. Lewis Bucky, two distinguished experts in the field of aesthetic surgery, to offer their perspectives on non-invasive and surgical modalities respectively. Today's podcast will cover indications for surgical and non-surgical treatments, controversies in these management decisions, and qualifications necessary to perform these interventions. I am happy to turn the microphone over to our moderator and speaker, Dr. Sachin Sridharani. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening and be talking about this really what I think is a hot topic for sure, which is the scalpel versus a syringe. Um, as mentioned, my name is Sachin Sridharani. I'm a plastic surgeon based in New York City and have a practice that focuses primarily on aesthetic plastic surgery. And I'm really honored to also have our guest, Dr. Lou Bucky, who really needs no introduction, but is an incredible plastic surgeon who's been in the field now for several years, who has a vast knowledge base and mastery of aesthetics and has really seen a significant number of overall changes as aesthetics has evolved. So Dr. Bucky, if I may call you Lou, welcome and happy to have you here today. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, it's an honor to be here and a pleasure to be here. Um, as you know, we both love talking about plastic surgery and uh, oftentimes these educational endeavors really help clarify things even for myself, for yourself, and hopefully for the people listening to us. Well, that was really well said. Um, there's no doubt that we've seen a tremendous amount of transition over the last couple of decades, um, really attributed to neuromodulators. What have you seen happen over the last 20 years with really the introduction of, I guess, Botox cosmetic into aesthetic practices? Well, I, I think that you know, when, once neuromodulators uh, were introduced, we realized that this is a true game changer. Um, you can reliably get results you know, for patients in a non-surgical fashion that are repeatable, reliable, uh, and are widely accepted. And, and I think previous to that, you couldn't see anything in the non-surgical arena that compared to what neuromodulators could do. The, the second thing that all these non-surgical treatments help evolve is really a better understanding, not only of anatomy, but of function, right? And, and so once we started using Botox, we understood a little bit more about what the corrugators did or the interplay between the frontalis muscle and the corrugators and really started understanding completely between the lifters of the brow and the depressors of the brow. And, and that understanding then led us to fine tune our results in a much more natural fashion. Um, if we didn't have Botox early on, I think the wide range of acceptance or evolution of non-surgical treatments would never have gone uh, as far or to the same degree. And so it was fortunate that Botox was an early non-surgical uh, endeavor or innovation because it really was a game changer in plastic surgery. Well, it's so interesting because, you know, so often individuals don't even realize when I'm lecturing or I'm connecting with other colleagues, they don't realize what we used to do in order to actually minimize you know, those horizontal ridids, right? As a frontalis myomectomy, and you think about the, the amount of uh, depression of the, of the overall frontalis or the contour irregularities. I mean, what were some of the things that you encountered when you're trying to address someone's corrugators if you're stripping them off the brow, which now, of course, we do in a matter of minutes um, in our clinic. And that, how did that evolve with patient expectations? Yeah, I, you know, it's a great point. And because in parallel 
we started um, utilizing endoscopic brow lifts, myomectomy of the corrugator muscle um, became very popular. And at some point there was a debate, should we be doing, and, and it took years to see the pros and cons of brow lifts, for instance, um, with, let's just say the corrugators, with resection of the corrugators, not only would you see an improvement immediately, but then you would start to see potentially depressions or you'd see recurrences. And it took a while to see that. Uh, with Botox, you had an injection. Uh, one week later, you would see the impact of uh, that injection and you knew right away. And there was very little downside other than um, understanding way back when that if you weren't careful with the location of your injection, you could get ptosis, for example, and even that was temporary. So I would say that we were balancing the pros and cons of surgery, particularly some of the negatives that it would take a while to see with the requirements of repeated doses of neurotoxin. But the morbidity of neurotoxin was much less than some of the morbidities associated with surgical treatments. The flip side was that the surgical outcomes sometimes were and oftentimes were long lasting and you didn't need repeated treatments. So the risk reward of both treatments had to be modulated or evaluated by the practitioner and understanding what was more appealing for the patient. Um, on some level. And staying with, uh -huh. and staying with kind of that, historical element, I guess, what were the controversies or if you can think of any that existed with the introduction? I mean, was it just really widely received? Were there a lot of concerns about injecting, you know, these toxins and what that's going to mean for surgical procedures or who should be injecting them, monitoring of patients? Like what were the things that, you know, created concern or were sort of controversial, if you can sort of think back to the last 15 to 20 years as they've become so popular now? Yeah. If I think back 20 years ago, the surgical mentality was things need to be long, long lasting or they worth, weren't worth doing at all. And how would patients never would like to come back to the office every three or four months for treatments? That certainly couldn't be effective. Um, we were so used to a surgical mentality that it was an all or none phenomenon. And certainly, um, because surgeons were, were performing surgery, um, the non-surgical treatments either needed to be performed by a surgeon as well, and yet there was some kind of thinking like, if you have to do these multiple injections, it's beneath us as surgeons to do. That was the intro mentality, if you will. Um, there was even skepticism on limited incision brow lift since we're talking about the forehead. And I think mm -hmm. some of the outcomes of that were over elevated brows that took a while to see what that would look like in people sort of getting a zombie appearance. We didn't believe that an endoscopic brow lift could truly work, if you will, at that time, truly elevate a brow for a substantial period of time. And therefore, we, we overdid that surgery or overdid the outcome. Um, then you bring in non-surgical treatments like Botox and say, you know, I wouldn't say there was confusion. I would say there was a lot of choices and where everything fit took many, many years to understand and, and really understand what the patient's response was to all that. We live in a very different world today, being able to delegate oftentimes these non-surgical procedures to physician extenders uh, under our care and still think that's okay or not and still understand that the refinement and the treatment of these non-surgical treatments take as much expertise as surgical treatments. Sure. And I'm looking forward to speaking about that once we sort of talk through some of our other uh, syringe versus scalpel. So we're thinking about, you know, pros and cons. I guess, what are your thoughts on the fact that currently, you know, we have four FDA approved neuromodulators in the market, right? You have our Botox cosmetic, we have Juveau, uh, Xeomin, and of course, Dysport, and, you know, an incoming filler from Revance that will, that's coming in on, you know, longer acting mechanism and, and through that 
pathway, but then others as well with Ugel and other companies that are coming to market with now four, five, six, you know, it's starting to look a lot like some of the other international markets. Mm -hmm. um, although it is the most widely performed cosmetic treatment, what's your take and the appetite, I guess, for that many, not specifically any one of those products going away, but the appetite, I guess, for the consumer or for us as clinicians sifting through having that many neuromodulators in our refrigerator or on our shelf, so to speak. Yeah, I think that uh, choice is good. Uh, and we've certainly learned a lot about the subtleties between the different neuromodulators. Um, diffusion, precision, dilution, dosing. Um, many of those aspects allow us to treat individual patients uniquely better because certain neuromodulators may be better for an individual or an anatomic area than others. However, there can ultimately lead to either confusion um, or just, you know, um, too much in the market in my mind tends to ultimately lead to commoditization uh, and, and, and almost too much information. It, moreover, it's not always the neuromodulator, but what works best in your hands. And I don't think that's too different from surgical choices. We have multiple, if you look at facelifts, there are multiple, right. you know, procedures, if you will. We call them all faceless, but they can be very different. Um, and what works well in my hands may not work well as well in your hands. And certainly what you do and provide expertise in, you know, oftentimes I'd like to mimic as well. So in summary, choice is good, but too much information sometimes can be confusing or too many options can be. And I don't think you have to be a master of all of them. I think you need to have a good understanding of a few and where they work best and in whom. And in patients who are resistant to one, maybe they'd be uh, effective with another. Well, I think, and that's so well said, I, I feel across the board again, and it would echo that competition is healthy. And I think those nuances could make us even better at our craft uh, because it gives us the ability, whether it's you want more longevity, specific muscle groups, you start thinking about certain types of neuromodulators that will come in with a much quicker onset, but then also dissipate earlier. Um, you know, some seem to have a little bit of a lighter touch, others feel a little bit stronger, heavier. So it's just understanding what one is comfortable with. But the commoditization piece, I suspect, is very real, right? We see that in all different cities and all different markets. And again, I'll tie in a bit later on to who's using these products as we and and how they're being used, but also the importance of not commoditizing something like medicine, um, which I think a lot of aesthetics has has gone to. Um, so I think if we think about sort of scalpel versus syringe for neuromodulators, I'm hearing from you that it's certainly been an incredible, you know, supplant to a lot of the surgical work we've done, but we've also been able to advance some of our surgical modalities by having these, because we've understood these muscles so much easier and better because we have millions of patients being injected with them and then get to see how isolating those muscle groups help. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, and I'll say again, innovation leads to a better understanding of the aesthetic of the anatomic area because we're looking at it so much. We're looking at fine tuning so much. We reevaluate what we've been doing and where we're going. Um, in addition, we reevaluate uh, beauty, if you will, and the aesthetic of the 1920s, particularly the brow is way different than the aesthetic of the 1970s and now the 2020s. Um, and we can achieve those goals, in particularly in the brow, both surgically and non-surgically. The brow is unique. Neurotoxins in that area are uniquely good. Um, and so scalpel versus syringe of the brow may be very different than the discussion of scalpel versus a syringe in the, in the face, the jawline and the neck. Perfect. Which is a great transition. I mean, I would say, you know, within that arena, certainly um, the syringe component for the neuromodulator for other muscle groups is something where that almost sometimes can become the primary, right? Like the masseter. I mean, we're not going and trying to denervate those or trying to trim those out, but for masseter hypertrophy from a functional perspective or, from an aesthetic perspective, 
that, you know, in a neuromodulator is certainly going to be a great option to create some of that atrophy in the shape of the aesthetic that we want to. But um, there's a role for each of, for, for either one as uh, these injectables, of course, as we start to migrate and talk about the other next ones. So thank Agreed. you for that summary. Well, let's move on though, like, as you said, to kind of the face in general. I mean, I think from a scalpel versus syringe perspective, there's no question that right after neuromodulators, dermal fillers and volumizing agents have become something, of course, that we've been using um, well before hyaluronic acid, but it really seems that it's the advent of HA that started to catapult this because of its more biocompatible nature. You mind talking me through what our scape of fillers was like maybe prior to the last 10 to 12 years and then take us through what it's turned into over the last decade? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, silicone predated me, although I saw some patients that were filled with silicone that had phenomenal results. I didn't see enough of it and it wasn't practicing at the time that that was as popular, particularly uh, in New York where you were practicing. Uh, but it did give longevity uh, that some patients appreciated. It also had complications that others didn't appreciate. Um, we then got into the world and popularity of um, certain um, uh, methyl methacrylate fillers, which had complications. So when it first came out, I would say that volumizers were problematic and they were oftentimes treated in the periphery of, by uh, physicians that were not always certified or physicians that were more, even if they were board certified uh, plastic surgeons or dermatologists, they were a little bit more on the fringe or adventurous and, and the long-term outcomes with some of those permanent fillers were problematic. Um, then came the world of fat where we found, and really a lot of this would, would be due to the um, aesthetic eye and incredible outcomes from Sid Coleman. Um, he really popularized in plastic surgery what we could be doing with fat. But once again, once you have a new innovation, we also understood the importance of volumization on aesthetics, the importance of volumization on aging and fat. Um, really fat to the face in particular became a whole new world that, that plastic surgeons adopted and, and either added to their surgical treatments or replaced some of their volumizing techniques. Um, and as you said, and then the next generation were HAs, but it was really fat that opened up my eyes to what volume could do on appearance and how natural it was and understanding what deflation was to the aging process, which brings us to the issue of it isn't really scalpel versus syringe, whether you're talking about fat or you're talking about HA or you're talking about uh, calcium hydroxyl appetite or even the biostimulators. Of course, like the polyol lactic acid. And exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think really what we're talking about is during the aging process, volume loss has a more rapid or uh, in significant role, and then ultimately gravitational changes. And when we try to make up for gravitational changes with volume restoration or volume, we lead to sometimes overdone volume restoration, in which case that patient probably would have done and looked much more natural with a anti-gravity procedure like a lift, and that's where surgery comes from. And so it, it may and may have been maybe more of a spectrum or an age related spectrum or a starter rejuvenation than, a, than an either or. Well, let's talk about, you know, for, for that specific indication, right, where you've got a patient who comes in who clearly would benefit from a well done facelift and they're like on their now eighth or 10th round of fillers, you can see that they've got that puffy face, you know, I call it you know, some filorexia, if anything, where you just have over volumization, you know, over augmented mid faces, 
leading to temporal, almost like, you know, it, it accentuates temporal hollows because that lateral zygoma is just over volumized across mm -hmm. the board. And they just don't look like themselves. Their head looks like it's going to explode because of just how much filler has been placed in it. And, and this is coming from someone who does do a lot of injectables himself in his practice I and mean, talk about sort of some of the different demographics, people performing them. But what's your approach or if they're just like, well, Dr. Bucky, I just don't want a facelift and I just need a little bit, but you know that that volume is maximized, but it's the skin and soft tissue envelope that is really now poorly behaving because there's no more volume really left to restore. What how do we start to address and deal with those difficult situations? It's a very liberating feeling to tell a patient that you just aren't going to treat them because you're certain it's not the right thing to do. Um, it takes a lot of time, confidence, and years of seeing and engaging with patients to be able to say that to someone. I think the beauty of our field, and you, you hinted on this a little bit, is that when you are younger or when we are first entering practice or the physician today is first entering practice, you're probably going to see patients that are a little bit younger, um, people who you socialize with, people referred by people you socialize with, et cetera, um, coming in and they aren't at the aging change where they need a facelift. They're really more in that volume loss neuromodulator category, even prejuvenation, if you will, if you're really young. It's a great place to start. Um, but somewhere along the line, you need to learn. We fortunately are experts in aging. We know what volume maximization is. We know where skin elasticity needs to be treated. We know when an anti-gravity procedure needs to be done. And you need to have the confidence to tell a patient, you know what? Um, you've had enough volume and, and you really need a lift and don't confuse the two. The problem we have is there are a lot of people walking around that either had a good facelift and no one recognizes them because, or that because they're so good, or they've been over volumized and people confuse that with surgery. Right. That's, that's a problem. But if I was to talk to a younger person, I would simply say, you know, um, you're fortunate that the people walking in probably don't all need to have a facelift. We have other options for them that are excellent, especially for deflation, especially for, uh, you know, brow aesthetics. We have treatments coming out with skin boosters, but we also have skincare treatments that help with lines that never happen. Those patients are excellent, appreciative patients for life. And at some point they will be good surgery patients. You then had the advantage of treating them appropriately, right? Right. It's sort of gone are the days where it's just a one and done surgical procedure to treat this aesthetic pathology, right? Or the aging pathology, so to speak. It's a function of understanding that, well, this is going to be something that will create the foundation, but then the maintaining of that treatment involves the laser, the chemical peel, or things that we've now brought into the fold into our plastic surgery practices, which probably in the past would be referred out because we're surgeons and we're only going to use our scalpel and that stuff is for someone else, right? Save that for the derm, save that for this person or whatnot. But I think we have a bit more of an active role now in understanding the importance and then, of course, the value as well of having those procedures in-house and understanding that aging process and talking the patient through it, even if it's not something that we have to perform every single time. thousand percent. And I also think on the flip side, because our volumizing, volumizing agents and neuromodulators have gotten so good, you can get incredibly good results with toxins and fillers. But the, the negative of that is some people then would say, oh, well, surgery is a last resort or it was a failure if they needed to have surgery. And the problem with that is, is that oftentimes surgery will give you an even better result with less frequent treatments, not being overdone. And so it, the beauty of being a plastic surgeon is you know in the aging process where most things fit. And if you are a... Uh, very, not only skilled, but a, a good facial surgeon, 
you know then when a patient comes to you, you can offer them and say, listen, this is a 10-year result. You're still going to have aging changes and need ongoing maintenance. But if you can give me the two to three week recovery, I can give you a result that's more natural, non-repeatable, uh, and probably economic in the long run, economically viable uh, treatment with surgery. It's not a last resort, but it's a pendulum that we're seeing. And, and as we go back and forth, we can individualize what patients need best based on what their goals are, their appearance is their economics and their, and their recovery opportunities. Um, I don't think that's scalpel versus syringe. I think it's a spectrum. Sure. Again, I would, yeah. So I would totally agree there. What I find though, is that the innovation in the syringe is happening so fast, right? Like it's tough at times to get as much innovation, at least what I'm seeing from the scalpel perspective, because there's, you know, within reason, a limited amount that one can continue to overall innovate within a surgical procedure on like, let's say facelifts and it's a beautiful operation and one that I love to perform, but you look at how many new fillers, for example, come out in a single year or the fact, okay, now it's HA plus biostimulatory or something with elastigen that's coming out or all these different innovation. So I think understanding the value of the syringe is important as a supplement, but it's still to this day, I don't think can actually fully surpass, at least right now, the beauty of what we can achieve with the scalpel, but more of a supplement at times. Is that fair or do I have that? No, I think, I think that's fair, but gravity is gravity. Volume is volume. Skin mm-hmm. elasticity uh, is skin elasticity, and the fact that we're coming out with treatments that help all those things um, may defer, like volume restoration may defer the appearance of, vol- of gravity, but only for a certain period of time. And I think there is always this enthusiasm explosion that then reality sets in, or there's also filler fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, where patients don't want to keep coming back and being injected. Isn't there something else I can do? And, uh, you know, oh, and then, then thirdly, you know, and I know that when a patient comes in and says, I'm resistant to fillers, they're not resistant to fillers. They just have so much laxity and volume loss that the fillers aren't doing what they once used to do some years before. Those are good facelift patients. The, the challenge is sometimes our best facelift patients are younger and younger. And while there isn't the industrial innovation behind facelift surgery, there are innovations that allow us to perform excellent facelifts younger, that allow us to perform facelifts that have longer recovery, excuse me, longer uh, results and shorter Mm -hmm. recovery, um, more limited incisions, so just overall less morbidity. And, And that's more of a steady, gradual, outcome that comes from what patients want. The days of the two, three month recovery after a facelift are really not as widely accepted today. Part of it might be the competition from fillers, but most of it is just a different lifestyle and and demands from our patients. And so we haven't stopped innovating. It just doesn't have as much industrial uh, pizzazz as we see from the multiple neuromodulators and fillers that are outcoming. And it's, it's not an either or. Well, and it taps into often what I feel like patients are, are asking for. They're like, I want something that's going to give me the longest or the best outcome, the least amount of downtime done by the person with the most experience in the world. And hopefully it's free. <laughs> right? That's like every aesthetic patient's dream. So certainly some of the procedures that we're talking about could tap into uh you know, the, the downtime component and some element of longevity, but it's still on just, just as you mentioned, the continuum. If we transition a bit from, you know, we've, we've spent the first half an hour here talking about things really above the clavicle, but I think there was a lot of excitement, whether it's off label or some of the new or a new on label injectable, let's take us to below the clavicle, right? With all the different work and things that we're considering and able to do in the sort of body contouring arena. And we're going to stay away from devices for now because we're primarily focusing on sort of syringe versus scalpel. Um, You've seen a 
a tremendous amount of interest, for example, in volumizing or contouring of the buttocks and hip dip, you know, fat reduction in a non-surgical capacity. And now, of course, cellulite as well, all that are being repurposed with either off-label injectables or then, of course, for the, for the cellulite component on-label What's been your take on what we're seeing, on what we're doing with the syringe on the body? And then we're going to talk a bit about scalpel as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Plastic surgery is unique in that we were, we're an innovative specialty, but we were late to the game of minimally invasive treatments. We were either surgical or non-surgical, and that's kind of scalpel versus syringe. Uh, in my world below the clavicle, particularly in the abdomen area, um, many of the best minimally invasive advances have occurred, but they're mostly device related. Um, and so we, we, again, while not talking about that, I think that there is a lot of growth in the minimally invasive areas of plastic surgery and the face too. Um, where it's, it's in about five years, our conversation is going to be scalpel versus syringe versus suture or something sure. along those lines, right? right? There'll, yeah. be a, there'll be a third thing in there. But, um, you know, biostimulators, um, are, you know, I see people who are just simply facial plastic surgeons, if you will, mastering biostimulators around the face and neck, now injecting elbows, knees, and other areas to smooth things out because they know how biostimulators work. Um, in, in the world of cellulite, while we have a treatment that is effective with just an injection, they're going to go up against the other choices of cellulite treatment that may be that are device related and patients are going to have the choice of minimally invasive treatment, hopefully just one treatment for cellulite versus non-invasive treatment uh, with probably a couple of treatments for cellulite versus no good surgical treatment for cellulite. And so you can't avoid talking about that minimally invasive treatment space. Um, and, and it taps know. into what a lot of patients are for which they're looking. So you either get left behind or you neglect or don't choose to treat that patient population or one adapts and understands that there is a lot of growth and innovation in, for example, just like I said, cellulite. Um, and so there really hasn't been a great sort of scalpel based treatment up until now, but it's something that, you know, for so many of us that are doing body contouring on a daily basis afflicts so many patients. So if we're not really learning or adopting some of those things, someone's, they're going to get treated by someone, right? It may as well be us understanding that we understand that pathophysiology better than anyone. And now we have the ability to use some of these treatments that are going to be a little bit less invasive, um, but can still deliver a nice outcome. Absolutely. And, you know, <clears throat> just like we looked at, talked about the brow and the aesthetics of the brow and understanding what that was about and some of the negatives, the the beauty of non-surgical treatments for something like cellulite has allowed us through, I would say, clinical studies, industrial partners, corporate partners, a better understanding of what cellulite really is. And that the ligamentous attachments may not simply be just one vertical ligament indenting, you know, uh, the skin, if you will. And that those ligamentous attachments are very different. Uh, and that cellulite in the buttock may be a completely different entity than cellulite in the thigh area. And, oh, absolutely. Right? The orientation, all of that. 100%. You know, we've, we've been fortunate to have a seat at the table to have done many of the clinical trials for some of these new technologies and, and the understanding now anatomically, because to be able to show, for example, the FDA an improvement means we really need to understand what it is that we're trying to achieve and, and how we're planning on treating that pathophysiology has led to so much more anatomic discussion about these problems, which does make us better surgeons. 
you know, septe and the way that they orient. So sorry to take you away from that, but no, that's exactly what, and you're a leader in this area. And, and I will say again, that 10 years ago, these discussions weren't, weren't had. The discussion of cellulite was about using suction cups and rolling things from the external area that would right. just, that would last a period of time and either be created by edema or something. And then we got into the world of injectables that, that has been successful and helpful. And now we're in the world of devices. And through all that, we have a better understanding what cellulite is. Um, and we'll do even better going forward. And, and I can foresee it being combination therapy um, where, you know, devices release tissue and fillers and biostimulators fill in some of those indentations so there's less recurrence. Um, and some people want just to have an injection and we have choices now. And again, as you said earlier, competition and choices are good. Innovation leads to a better understanding of anatomy and aesthetics and in plastic surgery that only leads to better outcomes for our patients. And not, and as you also said, not to get locked into one thing. We don't always like change but you can't avoid it. You may not be an innovator as, uh, as a plastic surgeon, but you can't avoid it because you have to still evaluate it. So if you're a plastic surgeon, by nature, you are living in the world of innovation and you can't avoid that regardless. You don't have to be the innovator, but you have to be a good evaluator of innovation so that you can provide your patients with the best possible outcomes. Sometimes it's combination therapy, Sometimes, uh, you know, two sisters or two brothers may need two different treatments based on their lifestyle and their goals for the same problem. Sure. And we've been tapping into that. It's interesting because in our practice, you know, here in New York, we find so many patients that are interested in having a surgeon's expertise and the comfort of us doing the treatment, but wanting a non-surgical modality, right? And so it was interesting when I first started my practice nearly a decade ago, you know, I wasn't getting a huge number of surgical referrals right out the gate, fresh out of fellowship, but I was tapping into the ability to inject at a confident level and do unique things with some of these injectables. And so, you know, we're using, for example, like large volumes of like sculptures, for example, of poly L lactic acid, or at times even large volumes of Kybella to help try to solve certain complex problems and also manage certain post-surgical issues as well, or a little bit of fat that's left behind post liposuction or someone who wants to just treat a specific area, but doesn't want surgery that may not be able to just have an applicator of a device applied in a very bespoke way. And so we can use a lot of these, I think, very uniquely. What I think has often led to sometimes poor adoption isn't an outcome, it's just cost because they can be and sometimes are often prohibitively expensive because they've been designed to be used in you know, logarithmically smaller amounts on the face. Um, but now you're taking it and trying to extrapolate and use it you know, on a larger body area. But often I've found it works and they do work which leads to, I think, unique opportunities if we can find ways to manage cost and everything. But um, it's certainly been met at times with its controversy. I can't believe that you're injecting this much into a buttocks. Why aren't you just doing surgery? I can't believe you chose to inject this much, you know, fat dissolving in a such kybella on an abdomen. Why don't you just do surgery? It's because a patient doesn't want it. I think if you feel confident that you can achieve an outcome that they're asking for, and we can, once they understand the risk benefit and, and the other uh, logistics involved with it, I don't see there any harm in trying to continue to move forward and treat the patients. But um, it's always interesting to present some of these cases with large volumes of injectables off label on other parts of the body and, and see some of the polarizing discussions surrounding it. Polarizing discussions often come from people feeling threatened from what they do, number one. But what you're really talking about and really what the crux of when you have choices and we have series of different, um, uh, not, not just choices, but areas of um, surgical and non-surgical treatments is expectation management, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would say that mastering certain treatments 
allow you to deliver better expectation management to patients. And what that means is not just getting locked into one, but knowing enough about what a particular, you know, biostimulator can do so that you know so much that you can give a patient a good expectation management that in larger volumes, I can get A, in really large volumes, I can get B, uh, it won't do C, and here's your cost, D, but there are a wide group of patients who have a wide variety of expectations um, or limitations that some of these treatments we can deliver safely, effectively, which you're saying, um, and the key is expectation management. If you are a young surgeon and you provide excellent expectation management, that patient's going to come back to you again for something else because you're going to be considered an expert and they aren't going to be disappointed. The problem we get into is that patients oftentimes will lead us into a world of a minimal treatment with maximal treatment expectations. And when you're younger, you can be... Um, influenced by the patient to a degree that allows you not to give them the treatment they're really looking for. Or you have to manage their expectations, really understand what they're coming in for and what you can deliver. Because if you under deliver, they're not coming back. And then you're going to be re treating them regardless. And if they are coming back, they're treating, you're treating them because they were unsatisfied or dissatisfied. And that usually leads to a less than positive outcome. That's the art of the consult. That's the art of what we're doing, being flexible enough to keep learning and knowing what things can give and being rigid enough to when to say no and when to know when enough is enough. Uh, I guess it's such a difference, right? It's such a, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such a different expectation in aesthetics, right? So, I mean, I was thinking about this, you know, I, was, I was with some folks that we were talking about design of a new study and looking at some of the preliminary data and one of the individuals that was part of it was effectively talking about, you know, came from a therapeutic space before entering the aesthetic space. And if you were doing a cholesterol med or a blood pressure med, and you told us that, you know, 30% of patients or 40% of patients had a substantial and meaningful reduction in their LDL or their systolic blood pressure or different things, they'd be like, wow, this is going to be a blockbuster drug potentially, right? Mm -hmm. If you do an aesthetic study and you said, well, 40% of patients saw a nice change and a nice improvement, you'd be like, well, what, you know, what's going to happen to the other six out of 10 patients that are going to pay for this and be dissatisfied that there's almost zero margin for error. So when you're setting up these expectations, as you mentioned, or building a practice or trying to maintain your practice from all these different avenues, it's almost like there's there's very little uh, margin for failure. It has to really be a significant improvement and outcome across the spectrum for a very large percentage of individuals. There's no doubt. And it's what makes this frustrating or fulfilling. You, you never master it. And we'd like to live in a world of black and white, but plastic surgery is not black and white. It's, there's, it's, there's a lot of gray. And, and again, there are times when I say, you know what, I'm not offering anything minimal at all anymore because every time I do, and even though I get a good outcome, the patient sees what's not finished or what's not complete. And am I crazy to be offering this? And then I'll take a step back and I'll say, okay, I haven't done a good enough job of managing their expectations. And if I did, isn't it beautiful that you can get an outcome that is really good with so minimal minimal invasiveness or minimal morbidity or minimal recovery? How do I communicate that adequately? And there goes, lies the, the necessary in, in need for improvement in communication, whether it's visualization, artificial intelligence in looking at patient outcomes, you know, photographs aren't always enough, but they're certainly better before and after. They're certainly better than they used to be. But there it is. At the end of the day, as we get more choices in our procedures, we have to match that with better communication of outcomes so that patients can make good decisions and we can see where they are. I mean, it's hard to compete at times with what a patient 
wants what the patient shows up with when they face tune or use an app <laughs> that completely you know changes the overall aesthetic and they think that it's just like ordering the new iphone right that i'm just gonna come walk into the office this is what my face needs to look like i blended it with three different celebrities i used this i shaved down my nose i took out my own buckle fat pad this is what i need to look like and it's like how does one translate that into wanting to try to care for this person but then also saying I don't need this at all in the office, right? Like this is just too much. So remember, um, what, I, remember what I said about experience? Right. <laughs> we've yeah. all tried to appease that patient. Right. And we've all felt the frustration ultimately of dissatisfaction or not understanding. And, the, and many of us have different degrees of patience with patients. Um, and the good part, again, of being younger and not being quite so busy is having the opportunity to interact with patients and engage with them and spend more time. Uh, but some of it is also learning about what you can t have tolerance for and what not. Um, and ignoring the management of patient expectations, in my mind, it leads to a unsatisfactory outcome for your practice over the long run. And we all migrate to things we're comfortable with or we think we're better at. And that's the beauty of this. But you have to be able to continue to communicate. You have to listen enough to what they want and uh, be able to deliver. And what do they say? Undersell and over deliver. That still holds true today. Uh, without that, your practice will be very frustrating, I think. Or we grow very insensitive. And neither of those are good. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it doesn't lead to, I mean, no one's going to be happy with that. I'm going to shift us for a little bit to within the world of, you know, scalpel versus syringe, but kind of breaking down syringe. There's a lot of people that have not spent a fraction of the amount of time as we spend in training or understanding anatomy um, or aesthetics that have jumped into the aesthetics arena, right? colleagues, different backgrounds with educational backgrounds, different credentials within even medicine itself, different specialties that have chosen to, you know, go into aesthetics for several different reasons, but often seem to be motivated more by their interest in sort of the beautification arena, but also the financial element. What have you seen and what concerns do you have about people who are wielding a syringe and at times seeming to masquerade as plastic surgeons. It's frustrating. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think it still holds true that you just need to continue to do what you do better. Um, I think plastic surgeons still, we, we all sit uh, or stand on the shoulders of those who were before us. We are tremendously committed to education those of us who are well-founded in a good education continue to learn, and that keeps us a half a step ahead. If it was to simplify things, I'd look at it in two different areas. One is, you know, if all you have is a syringe, then you don't know what's the best outcome for patients because you're not qualified. You haven't looked at or seen the outcomes and knowing what a good outcome is. And there's it's very narrow space. You know, it's like saying, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world's a nail. But mm -hmm. the other thing is, which I think is even more important, is if you can't manage the complications for what you're doing, you shouldn't be doing it. Thousand percent. And yeah. there lies one black and white area that you probably can never be misguided about. Um, I can't stop the person next door unless I was interested in a political arena and trying right. to do that. That doesn't where my, my strengths aren't there. I don't have the energy or the expertise, but I do have the energy still and the expertise to try and deliver the best outcomes for our patients. I do have the energy and expertise to try and engage and learn from my colleagues who are the best around. Um, that keeps me going. That gets me excited still. I, I, I feel badly, and I guess we are hurt by the less than optimal outcomes by providers, both in our own specialty, but moreover in other specialties that don't deliver good outcomes. And they're all, we're all considered, quote, plastic surgeons or cosmetic surgeons. It's a problem. But the only thing we can do is keep doing what we do well, um, 
thank our societies for differentiating and for putting educational programs like this on and trying to continue to do this in the best level in which we can. I think it's historically, we've never done well in preventing others from approaching our field. We've only done well by delivering the best outcomes that we can. And I don't think that's changed. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, across the board, you know, it's interesting because I, I'm asked at times to you know, do a lot of lecturing or education, and I don't control who's in the audience. But the goal is to, again, be a good provider of education and hopefully just inspire other plastic surgeons to do a lot of these treatments and adopt them into the practice because it is the evolution of, you know, a lot of what we do. If you look at other surgical specialties or general surgery or orthopedics, I mean, the goal historically is to continue to evolve into less and less invasive approaches with less downtime, but with equally great outcomes. And so we're supplementing and complementing so much of what we've historically done with a scalpel with a syringe. And so we just have to do it at a much better level, at a higher level. And we have the anatomy in the background to understand that the future development of so much of this is headed to the body. And so we can either give all those up or we can understand this is, this is our arena. This is a place where we know so much better than many of the other specialties that aren't accustomed to working on extremities or the breasts or the abdomen or any one of these areas. And we can do it because it's, it's a comprehensive part of our education and, and our background. Yeah. Um, Being... But it is interesting to see people who don't have any of that expertise. They're just heavily motivated by, you know, whether it's the financials or kind of a backdoor into basically, again, sort of masquerading as cosmetic surgeons i'm using quotes around my hand with my hands right now that are trying to do what it is that we also do and often sort of really tread and cross the line into it but without the appropriate background well there's there's no doubt i would be um i i feel fortunate to on one hand i i think it's very exciting to be going into the practice of plastic surgery today with all the options that we have with the advanced level of education, the advanced level to communicate to people. On the other hand, I'd be very frustrated with the role that social media has taken to qualify people through non peer reviewed before and afters and non peer reviewed studies. And so well, the, peer, the peer review is the number of likes and the number of followers. That's the peer percent. review, right? Right. That become the validation of it very difficult. So you have a much people who are starting in practice have a much different, uh, have many different challenges on how to differentiate themselves. Um, and over time it will be okay, but I think it's going to take, um, a different approach to help take care of patients and to set ourselves apart. And it's, it's a, a challenge that we cannot uh, allow to get away from us. We can't be so narrow-minded as to stand on our laurels and stand in our past. On the other hand, we need to stay above the fray and make sure that we're setting the best example. Um, fortunately, there are leaders in our specialties that do that well. Uh, I'm not one of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but and again, uh, on a larger scale, we need to do, be aware of all that. Um, on a smaller scale, all you can control is the people who are in your office, the patient that's in front of you, to do the best work you can to keep educating yourself, to know what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And those things bear themselves out. And then the last piece is very few practices are just dependent on the doctor alone. You either have physician mm -hmm. extenders, nurse injectors, and certainly staff that reflect what you're doing, how you do things. And we can't underestimate the need for that consistency. You want to find patients, we want to find patients that are attracted to us as much as we're attracted to them. And that's very important. We think we forget about that. And certainly when it's early in practice, you're not sure what that all means. But later on, when you look back and you know what you're all about and you get fortunate enough to have people referred by people you like taking care of, it tends to work itself out. And, and, I, and I used to be so obsessed with that early on that I'm, I'm, I'm relieved not to be now. Well, it's tough because you're trying to create a culture, right? You're trying to set a culture. You're trying to 
build some type of attraction or what it is that makes you feel comfortable. And at some point you're like, come one, come all. But at another level, you want to cultivate the types of people you want in your practice, in your team, the types of patients that you want based on your you know, overall demographics, where you are in location and just what appeals to you. And it's sort of like a, trying to find yourself, right? You're trying to create a practice. You're trying to build that. And you're also trying to create a culture all simultaneously, figure out the types of procedures that you want to be performing and what it is that you want to be known for and how to get there. And then, of course, getting that buy-in and inspiring people who don't know you at all that you have to convince in a few minute job interview to join you and to be part of it. It's, it's also very much a, a, you know, a different market with, with bringing on team members and staff. It takes us a little bit from our scalpel versus syringe, but as we're kind of starting to wrap up and close, how does one cultivate that and bring in the types of staff and the people that believe fundamentally in what it is that you're hoping to achieve and the types of procedures that you're performing? I, I couldn't agree with you more. So it's it there's there's we've just gone from patient management to practice management, right? And and I guess the best way to say that is if you have a certain expectation of what you want for your patient, we all don't have the same strengths. Um if I think about it like golf, some people have a good short game, some people are better drivers of the golf ball. Well, some of us are more focused on surgical technique. And don't have the personalities quite to engage with patients, then you better have um, staff that can advocate for you or do that for you because patients need good preoperative attention, excellent operative management, and careful postoperative management. And you need a team to deliver all that. If you're lucky, then that's you and it's just one person, so be it. Very unusual. If you have certain skills, you're far better off recognizing that and surrounding yourself with a staff that fill in the other things. And then there's a consistency to the practice that patients benefit from. Um, it takes a lot of looking inward as much as looking outward. Uh, and, it, and those things are important today. Uh, but that's really what you're saying. And I used to tell the residents there's a balance between patients and impatients. Uh, patients with your growth and getting busy and yet an energy to learn and be available and deliver good care to your patients. That's, that's the challenge we have for the many years. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, as you said earlier, we're in a specialty where patients' expectations are very high based on both realistic information and sometimes or now frequently unrealistic information. And um, the more we're educated on the scalpel and the more we're educated on the syringe, the better we can offer patients good outcomes. And here's a person, you told me you're 10 years in practice, you've mastered certain areas, you know where you need to go. I'm 25 years in practice. I'm still excited about practice. I've had a mm -hmm. look backward you can hear the passion. and still go forward, but we represent a lot of what plastic surgeons today are facing and uh, the challenges that are ahead of us. But, you know, if we, if we keep doing this and engaging with each other, I think the, and, and understanding that the leadership in plastic surgery has our best interests, we should still do okay. Well, that is incredibly well said. You know, this discussion started with the topic of scalpel versus syringe. And I think what we've come to realize is that our scalpel has definitely been complemented by the syringe and at the same time has also given us the opportunity to go to other areas and create a tremendous amount of innovation. So it's really not one or the other, but as you've said a few times now on this continuum, and a fundamental understanding of how they can balance one another out. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Sachin Shridharani. It's an honor to be the EdNet Aesthetics section vice chair and have our guest, Dr. Lou Bucky, who once again really needed no introduction, who has been uh, an incredible advocate of plastic surgery at so many levels and had held so many different leadership positions. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule. I've had 
the honor of spending a little bit of time in your practice. So I was very grateful for you welcoming me down there to meet your incredible team and see what you've created uh, right there in the main line in, in uh, Philadelphia. And um, we should all be so fortunate to foster and build practices similar to yours. So thank you for taking the time to be here and our ASPS University Dean, Dr. Stephanie Farber, and most importantly to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons to giving us this opportunity to share all this knowledge and to learn so much from you. Thank you for committing to education for us in aesthetics. And uh, once again, honored to have you on today, Dr. Bucky. Thank you, Sachin. It's always uh, enjoyable to talk plastic surgery with uh, bright plastic surgeons. So um, look forward to doing it again. Thanks so much for having me.